having the the hard thing to do in say like a green screen shoot is generating that ambience, right? Because light, if you're outside and sunlight's reflecting off of the building and it's you know shining onto your talent, that's a very hard thing to replicate because you have to just if you're on a green screen, just imagine how it would would happen. So you do get that for free in a virtual production environment, but you still have to rely on a key and you still have to account for things like color shift in the wall as well. Well, and and that brings up a point about how to work an inside of Unreal because. Before Unreal 5, you had to generate bounce information, you had to generate color reflectance, you had to do all of the things that you were trying to do on set to be able to mimic it in the real world. And it's difficult for people to understand that. It's complicated. Well, I will say, Unreal 5 is a, is a fantastic tool. I think it's going to change a lot of things about the way we work. However, uh, the current version of Unreal 5, even though it is a, a 1.0 release, is not yet recommended by Epic for virtual production. And uh, they are working on a version, uh, an, an, a release that is more suited for virtual production. However, Lumen may not be a part of that because Lumen relies on a lot of screen space effects. Right. So we'll see if they figure it out. Um, but it's looking right now. People are having some issues with Lumen and display. Well, and, and that's an interesting part about all of this because you know there's so many aspects of virtual production. It's not just cameras and lenses and walls. I mean, there's a whole interconnect in computers and connectivity. But there's also a secondary display structure and how you get it out of in-display and some of the other processes that are in there, disguise and, and, and some of the other tools that are used for projection systems. I mean, how many different systems are there that are involved in all of this in a normal virtual production? Because I don't think people realize how many like pieces there are. There's a lot of pieces, yeah. I mean, at a, at a core level, you can go from a computer to a display, right? You can go from a computer to like a TV, right? So if you're at home, um, you can absolutely just set up a very simple and display setup for like that. However, in a production environment, when you're dealing with LED walls, you're going to need to go from the computer, you're going to need to go into an LED processor. That's then going to send the data to your LED wall. A lot of times, people use something like a Barco E2 to manage your inputs and outputs and your scaling um, and things like that, which does make life a lot easier. And then if you want to add on top of that uh, another layer, you can use something like Disguise or you can use something, a product like Pixera, which adds a sort of wrapper around Unreal that makes it easier to use um, to do certain things. Uh, and for example, like in Disguise, you have like automatic calibration of color and things like that as well. So a lot of really cool features. But it adds complexity, it adds time, it adds cost. It's just a lot of pieces. And, and, and actually, com the complexity is a big part. Because there's so many moving parts in virtual production that, that I, I mean, and just because it worked yesterday does not mean it's going to work today. Yes. That's, a part, that's, a, that's a number one rule of computers in general, just for everybody. Just because it worked yesterday, it's not going to work today. That's the difference in, you know, I, like everyone is excited about this, the future of software, and software is the future, right? Well, that's the downside with software, is it changes day to day. You buy, you know, an Alexa, obviously they can update the firmware, but the hardware is going to remain the same forever for the time that you own it. Um, you it's not necessarily the case with something like Unreal Engine. Oh, God, no. <laughs> but, but Andy, there's so many things that get involved with it, and people don't think about some of the little things that, that can cause a production to blow up. You know, um, lens encoding, um, you know, issues with Moray. And, and, and it's funny because everybody talks about Moray on virtual walls, but you don't really see it that much because so many people work around the difficulty as much as they can. Yeah, Moray is definitely, it, it is absolutely present and it is a ma major limitation that you can't focus on the screen. But, you know, you don't need to be like an insane focal length and a wide open aperture all the time in order to make it work. Obviously it helps, um, but it's less of a problem than a lot of people think that it will be on the day. Well, especially as the screen sizes, the, the pitch of the screen sizes gets tighter and tighter. One of the things that I, we found was pretty interesting when we started doing testing is every time you reduce the pitch, pixel pitch on a screen by, by 0.5 centimeters, half a centimeter, um, you know, it, it reduces the light by a full stop. Yeah, the way that, uh, I gave a uh, talk yeah. on this yesterday, but the way that LED panels are designed, the tighter the pixel pitches go, the higher resolution, which is good, but there are some downsides as well, and one of the major ones is that you lose brightness in the screen. And ultimately, you need to think about the screens as, I think about them as opposite cameras, right? A camera can see a certain amount of dynamic range, so you need to fill that dynamic range with a certain amount of contrast. So the dimmer your screen is, the less contrast it can put out, i.e., the less stops of dynamic range you can display. This is why like HDR displays are a thing. Um, and ultimately, you are not presenting the camera with as much information. So there are, you don't get anything for free, basically. And you bring up HDR as a big point about this, because the screens are mostly 709, Rec. 709. Um, and, and that's 
an issue to some, but the reality of it is is that you're recording a signal in log, the picture's going to look the way it looks. But, but the brightness issue of the screens is you, you bring up a real interesting thing, is if you're working in HDR, and if you're working in a desktop in HDR, you want 1,000 nits or 297 foot Lamberts you know, is the, the screen display output. No, oh, no, I actually have to know that. The 297 foot Lamberts, a normal television, a normal movie screen is somewhere around 12 to 15 foot Lamberts, maybe 30 in a movie theater. An HDR screen has to be 297 foot Lamberts of brightness at the maximum mid. That matches 1,000 nits on a display. And it's interesting that people don't think about that kind of stuff. Yeah, if you're, if you're targeting a 1,000 nit master, essentially, and you have, you're shooting on an LED wall that only outputs 500 nits, what do you do? You have to choose where you map that dynamic range, and you have to understand that there's going to be missing data there. And you have to consciously decide where you're going to put that missing data. So. And, and, and how that data gets in is always, I mean, people, everybody thinks that Unreal is the greatest thing, but people forget about the processing power in it. And how when you have a wall like the one that's, that's up on the stage here, or what your walls are going to be at Smash, you have to segment the parts of the wall. Because one processor can't fill an entire wall worth of data in real time. That's actually one of the big issues that people don't understand. And you have to have, I mean, a 60-foot wall may have three or four computer processors for each segment of the wall to be able to be able to render the content and, and quality in real time and the data in the way we need it. I'm tripping through that here. No, that, that makes sense, though. Like, at the end of the day, we're dealing with a, dis a display port signal, right? Which is going to be, at most, a UHD signal. So that means that the most data that you can push out of one port is UHD. So if you have a screen, an LED wall that's you know, large enough, that's bigger than UHD, you need multiple LED processors. So you can either drive that with multiple render nodes or multiple outputs of a single render node, but then you could be running into processing power issues. Because the other thing with virtual production and you know, with filmmaking in general is we really have one standard, right? Does the audience believe it? Do they think that it's real? And so we have a certain level of fidelity that we need to hit, and it just so happens that that's very taxing on computers. And so things can scale very quickly and very complexly very fast. And, and, and scaling very, very quickly and very complexly means that failure is op an option. A lot of failure points, yeah. <laughs> well, and people don't think about that. But, you know, they don't think about the power that it needs to process the video wall in addition to everything else. I mean, you know, the, the number of computers that's needed for a virtual production just to drive the wall is far more than people even understand. I mean, it's not uncommon to have six or eight or ten render nodes for just a small wall. And these are not lightweight machines. These machines are heavy duty, you know, NVIDIA. What, what, what are you going to put in yours? A6000s. A6000s. Yeah. Did, did you SLI them? Did you tie them together? No, but we, uh, we bought a lot of computers with the intention of reconfiguring them as needed. So. Oh, okay. So, so you, I mean, you're using the most expensive video cards, the most high, the highest processing power processing machines, and custom building all of it. And, and that's the problem is, is that the problem with virtual production right now is everything is bespoke. We haven't gotten to the point where you can walk in and just do a production. It's not a simple, easy way to do virtual production. We haven't gotten to that point. Guys like Andy and I are working to that level, but we haven't achieved it yet. And it's important for us to, to, to move that forward as a part of the industry. Yeah, we'll get there. I mean, we are in the early days. The analogy to, that I like to make is that when digital capture first started, when we were transitioning from film, the camera that was used on like Attack of the Clones is the Sony F900. They didn't use that because it was the best option, because it was the best camera. They used it because it was kind of the only camera at the time that they could that could shoot the frame rate that they needed it to. Um, and that's where we're at with Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine, it's not the best tool for what we're doing. In many ways, it's a bad tool for what we're doing. But it is, right now, the best tool that we have available. And that's kind of the same way the whole, throughout the whole chain. Um, manufacturers are fully aware of this. People are working to improve the process. It's just going to take time. Well, and that was one of the interesting things. You, unfortunately, couldn't go to NAB because you were working on your studio space. But it's like, NAB, every other booth had something to do with virtual production. And most of it was. Um, show. There were a lot of show ponies at NAB. I mean, you see these giant 100-foot virtual walls, and they were not showing any moving objects on them. Everything was static. So it's like it meant that they didn't have enough processing power to have something move on it. They had to leave it static to do that. And it was one of the in in indicators that I saw in a couple of situations that this doesn't look right. You know, why, why does this not look right? And, and yeah, and a big reason for that is oftentimes people don't consider the complexity of it. They think, oh, you know, it's going to be easier than it is. And so by the time the show is happening, they haven't given themselves enough time to build a more proper demo, and so they wind up with what they have. And that's just the reality of it at this point. So uh, 
What do we see as a future for virtual production? How do you see it here? I mean, you're building a studio in Chicago with plans for more because of the, how you see this technology changing our lives. What's the future of virtual production? I mean, the reason that I got into this industry in the first place, into virtual production, is because I've worked here for a decade now, and I've worked in you know the sub-zero conditions. I've worked at the bottom of that godforsaken quarry that we all hate, right? I've worked, <laughs> I've worked in, in rain, all these horrible conditions. And at the end of the day, you know, if we can simulate all of that in a way that the audience can't tell the difference, well, then everybody wins. We get more creative control, and the crew is happier, and that will directly result in better projects. And so that's really where I'm coming at this from. Is I want to make production easier and safer and faster. Um, in terms of where virtual production itself is going, it's just going to become more plug and play with time. The things that we have to think about, things like uh, Genlock Sync, for example, or color calibration, will, with time, just become you know, plug and play, part of the standard, as all the manufacturers start to work together to develop these new standards and these new interoperability uh, features um, that will make everything talk to each other nicer. Well, and, and, and that's the reality of it, is like we have to do that. Because right now it's bespoke systems, everything is customized, it's giant screens. I mean, uh, he and I have had a number of discussions. The fact that everybody wants to do, you know, a 100 meter wall I find pretty interesting because 99% of it's not used and it's a whole lot of power going to waste. You know, there's green aspects to it also. But I'm waiting for being able to see this as um, an advent for industrial and corporate America, you know, where the CEO's in there. Much like you see with, you know, the television stations now. and and people forget that, that a lot of this production, a lot of virtual production is what we've been doing on television with weather and that, and, and specifically the weather channel has been ahead of everybody in this for a long time. If you're not watching the weather channel and not seeing what they do in virtual production, how they're standing in a set and showing earthquakes and floods and things like that, you're not seeing the capabilities of what could be the future of all of this. And a lot of this is for broadcast right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean a lot of the well a lot of the tools that we're using come from broadcast because again, that's what's available. A lot of like the camera tracking systems that we use nowadays and that are available, they were meant to be used in TV news studios and they're really good at that. And then you start talking with them and you're like, "Well, what if we want want to mount the camera upside down on a jib and do a roll move?" And they're like, "Oh, well, we've never had to do that before." So it's going to cause these manufacturers to start thinking in different ways. You know, it is true that a lot of production, you know, everyone thinks they need a giant screen, they think they need an LED ceiling, and sometimes they think they need an LED floor, which they don't. Um, <laughs> But it's, it is funny that, you know, you're right, that most scenes at the, at the end of the day are like two people talking in a room and you don't need a giant wraparound volume for it. However, you know, at Smash, we are building a screen that is like a 114 foot long wraparound LED volume. And the reason for that is because we want to give the option of larger scenes. If you want to shoot an action scene, you want to shoot some battle sequence, or you want to pull in two cars and do a car chase or something like that, you know, we want to give people that option. So it just depends what you're trying to do. Well, and, and, and that's the truth too. It's being available for everything else. Not that you necessarily need that for every show. And that's kind of what I was pointing out is like, um, you know, when they did the Nearby Far Away, you know, a single wall, much not, not that much larger than what we have here on the show floor. So that's an interesting aspect of it. Um, let's talk about crews. Um, you know, everybody's worried that this is going to take away jobs. You know, it's going to be less jobs for everybody in virtual, if they're in virtual production. Do you actually see that? Or are you like me and thinking about, no, there's more crew positions popping up that we haven't even figured out where they belong in the union yet? It will, it will reduce some crew, right? If you consider a big day, a big location day, right? You're typically, you're talking about locking up a street, you're talking about hiring additional crew, you're talking about hiring a lot of extras, you're talking about um, locate, like getting people to the location, like how, much, you know, how many pass vans do you need to get the whole crew there? Things like that are going to be reduced significantly. So there, there is a loss with there. The cost and associated with it though. Correct. Yeah, I mean, so Correct. it's a reduction in the cost. There's a yep. reduction in crew, and it's the a time. reduction in cost and time. Yeah. Um, however, we are, you know, so there is a loss there. However, your core crew is not gonna be touched, right? Really, I don't ever see this being like, oh, we're shooting this, we're shooting a lot of virtual in this show, so we're gonna, you know, cut the grip department in half. I, I really don't see that ever happening. Um, but you are gaining some positions, right? You're gaining a virtual production supervisor, you're gaining at least an Unreal Engine operator, you're gaining an LED technician at a bare minimum. You, an IT person. An IT person. Yeah, see, this is yeah. one of those things I laugh about. <laughs> People forget that in this environment, you've got to have an IT guy. You have to have somebody who's dedicated to doing just IT. 
Because when you talk about port mapping and IP addressing and all the other things that go involved to networking a series of computers, multiple devices, not just computers, you're talking about audio, video, lighting, signal issues. I mean, there's so many different bits of metadata that are involved in this. The pipeline around all this stuff is just massive. And then you have to make it time together. You know, you've got to be able to slew timing signals. So stuff that coming over wireless matches when the when the electronic, when the wired things hit and that, you know, all of a sudden you get into issues where you're slewing audio or you're adjusting time or you're, you're slowing the video down to match the audio delays and there's lots of things involved in that that are, that are incredibly complicated. Yeah, uh, it, it is interesting and, you know, obviously one of the you, you guys talked about this a little bit yesterday, but one of the key things about synchronizing things is Genlock, right? And being able to synchronize the camera's shutter with the LED walls, with the content. And it is interesting how camera manufacturers for the last, you know, 10 or so years have not really considered Genlock to be essential, you know, ever, anything past the, the 3D era. To the point where they took it out of cameras and only just started bringing it back yeah. last year. And, and now there's some wonkiness with certain cameras and things like that. So it is really interesting. But it's also funny because I can't even begin to tell you the amount of conversations I've had with people who are setting up studios and they're like, all right, we have have, uh, we got an OptiTrack system, so our camera tracking is wireless. We have uh, we we use a Raspberry Pi for the lens encoders, so those are wireless. How do we make the Genlock wireless? And you're like, you don't. There's always there's always going to be at least one wire coming off of your camera, forever probably until they invent faster than light uh, information travel. <laughs> well, or they they tie the 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 video transmission into the metadata side where it can actually call, you know, you've yeah. got return and things like that. So, but yeah, I mean, and people don't think about how complicated it is. I mean, you look at all the moving parts and, and realize that, you know, it's, it's this, this plethora of information that's a, that abounds on set, in addition to EM radiation from every single thing in there. So you have to worry about all of the stuff that you never had to worry about before. Yeah, it, it, you know, it just goes back to the complexity, right? It's a lot more moving pieces. And that's not to say that it's a bad thing, right? But it's just, you have to, you have to tell people that, yes, this technology, when you have the proper prep, can be a you know, revolution to the way that you shoot. But you have to be willing to put in that prep. You can't just walk up on the day and expect everything to work 100% of the time. And you can't expect it to work 100% of the time with the equipment that you're used to using. Like the Alexa Mini, for example, is a pain in the butt, the original one, to use with virtual production because it doesn't have a Genlock port. And you can synchronize it through time code. Sound department loves that. So, you know, it's, there are things to consider. You can't just walk up onto a set and expect everything to play nicely. Yeah, and 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 uh, you know, and and you bring up the part about that, just some of the things that we run into, and it's like everybody likes airy cameras, and but you know the one that everybody likes to use, Reds are the same way. They don't really necessarily gen lock. The Komodo does great, and the other thing is global shutters. There's uh, there's an issue with uh, some cameras tend to show the more a pattern differently or the pixel pattern a little bit differently than everything else does because of the way their shutters work and that's an issue too. Yeah, at the end of the day we're dealing, you're trying to synchronize a rolling shutter camera to a LED screen which is not refreshing every pixel at the same time. It's refreshing multiple sub pixels within a frame and that's very tricky to do and some cameras are better and some cameras are worse but the Red Komodo being a global shutter pretty much always works 100% of the time. Now there are downsides to making global shutter cameras. There's reasons why manufacturers don't do it. Um, but it is interesting. And now the other interesting thing is we're talking about a lot of this technology coming from broadcast. Well, a lot of broadcast cameras are global shutter. And so, you know, manufacturers would be like, oh, it looks, looks great on camera. And they're, you know, expecting that you're going to be using TV studio cameras. Um, and then you roll up with a, with a Venice or an Alexa or something, and they're confused as to why it's not looking as good as they're used to seeing. So, yeah. With, with, with a much larger sensor. Because like, <laughs> broadcast cameras are traditionally pretty small Which sensors. takes a longer time to, with like a full frame sensor, it takes a longer time. See, and people don't think about that. It's, it's every step in the chain has some issue that you have to deal with. And it's fascinating that people don't understand that. Yeah, uh, I mean, again, it, but it's, it's, the reason they don't understand is because they just, they don't know that they have to understand it, you know? It's, it, it is a new technology. You don't, know, you, you don't know you've hit the pothole until you hit the pothole. That's exactly it, yeah. You know, it's not like, oh, it's a new camera, it's a new light. Like, I know what a camera is, I know what a light is. It's a new way, it's virtual production. It's a new way of shooting anything, right? And so you just have to, approach it as though you know nothing. You know, you know, for better or for worse, we work in an industry with a lot of egos. People don't like to admit they know nothing, so sometimes you run into conflicts. Oh, you're laughing out here in the audience. Yeah, and, uh, we know who you are then. <laughs> but, but, so let's talk about production schedules. You know, because people don't think about, you know, it's like everybody thinks they can just drop into a wall and, and uh, oh, I built this scene in Unreal and it's going to work and I'm going to throw it up on a wall and everything's fine. Doesn't work that way. No, 
I mean, there's <laughs> you, obviously you need to be able to prep the the um, you know the mechanical and the electronic backend as far as the camera tracking and the render nodes. But additionally, you know, how does the camera perceive the wall? Do we need to color correct the content or the screen to make it appear better on camera? How do the lenses affect that? Because lenses have different color casts, so it may not look correct. And if you're just shooting, if you plop someone in front of an LED wall and you're just shooting that, fine. Maybe that's less of an uh, important requirement. But if you have set pieces and props at the foreground and those need to match the background, that's a lot of work. That takes time. And so that is, you know, something that is, it's just work that has to be done, right? And you have to c build in the time to do that. One of the, the tricky things about that is that means that we need a prep day that is not a pre-light day, that is only a virtual production prep day, and we need the cameras and lenses that you're going to use. And for a lot of shoots, for most shoots, that's a tall ask, because, you know, they're using them. Right. So, so these are things that you have to consider, you just have to think about that, you know, productions don't know yet that they need to think about. So, so, so see, that's something that people don't think about. It's like you have a couple of days to build the wall, if it's not pre-lit, well, you're going to assume that you're going to have the, the walls are not always assembled. But a couple of days to build a wall, you're going to have to have a pre-light day and, and a prep day, an unreal prep day with camera tracking and everything else. And now you have to have a day just to make sure that unreal works the way it is. So you, you know, change the tent color and move the position and do that kind of thing. I, I, when you did the piece that originally that we're doing there, it was really interesting because everybody was always fascinated how you darkened the wall and you worked in unreal to darken the transition to where it hit the wall to make it a more realistic effect. And a lot of people like saw that and were really surprised. It's like, why does that look that way? It's like, no, it really does look that way. Yeah, and, and you're doing that. So what he's talking about is in Unreal, you, you know, if you're familiar with the concept of power windows and color grading, where you can you know, selectively color grade sections of the frame differently. Well, in Unreal, you can do that in 3D. You can say, I want this section of the world to be a different color than the rest. And you can use that to blend edges together and to feather the real world into the virtual world. And to your eye, it looks totally weird and wrong because you're looking at it from the wrong perspective. But through the camera, it's the correct perspective and it lines up really well. Um, and it's just, you know, one of those really interesting tools. You know, you can also, you know, I know we were talking about not using the LED walls as lighting, but you can just throw up like a splash of color or maybe a video clip of fire or something in the background just to provide lighting and reflections. Um, and you can, use, you can use the wall as a light for, you know, certain special effects circumstances. Well, and, and, that, and that's a good point because we do use the wall. We use it as a light source for the reflections and all of that. So it's, it, but we're, when we talk about lighting with the wall, we're talking about lighting the main characters and lighting the dominant parts of the scene, not using the ambience from the wall because that's what is the is the wonderful benefit of LEDs is getting that that ambience that wraps around and throws through things and and it's funny because we, we were in a discussion yesterday talking about it people don't think the fact that that when you have the background shining through a glass object and you're shooting somebody in a restaurant and they've got a wine glass and there's wine and the reflection through it if you have to change the background you still have the reflection through the glass you don't have to go back and reproduce that you don't have to rebuild that and and the reflection side of this and the ambient side of it so much but it's also you know it's the discussion that that uh, um, Zoe Kravitz has in, in the Batman trailer where she's talking about the virtual production scene with them about that it made me feel like I was 20 stories up. It made me, I assumed my character felt more, I felt more in character when I was on there because it, I looked like I was doing that. And that's one of the things that we, we talk about the production side of it all the time, but we don't just like talk about the effect it has on the actors and the talent. Yeah, and it's huge. And at the end of the day, that is going to show up on film. If you, you know, as a director can tell your talent, look at that garbage can, and there's a garbage can there virtually, that's a big deal. Everyone's looking at the same thing versus on a green screen where you say, you know, look at that monster and everyone's just staring off at some dot somewhere that they assume. Trying to find a, trying to find a tennis ball that's yeah, flaming exactly. around. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it, it seems like a small thing to us as the crew, right? We just want them to hurry up and deliver their lines so we can go home. But it is a big thing to them. And at the end of the day, we are trying to make content that people enjoy, that we're proud to say that we've worked on. And these are the small things that add up to making that content. Um, let's talk about lighting for a minute. And, and what you have to do to like protect the wall. I mean, because you and I have, have we, we, we've had this joke running for a long time, because it's like, you know, everybody thinks that, that you can throw any kind of light up that you want, and the reality of it is, is that light needs to be masked and shaded, and, and you know, we've got like egg crates on here that need to be three times tighter for where we're at in here, just for this wall to light. The, but it's a real problem. And you, don't, you know, we get washed out if things aren't right. And it, it, that takes us out of the scene. Any light on the wall is wrong. So talk to me about some of the tricks you're going to use to do this. How, what do we do to make this better? Well, for a second, I thought you were talking about physically protecting the wall, because that is, we could talk about that later, but that is a thing, because people will bump into it with C-stands and knock off pixels, and that is the whole thing. Um, but you know, specifically with lighting, and this is, again, coming back to you know, thinking about cinematography 
and lighting in a different way, is you can't just roll up and continue the way that you've always continued. There are more considerations, and lighting is a, is a big part of that. If you have a light, if you have like a bright key, if you're emulating the sun, well, that is going to spill onto the wall if you're not careful, and that is going to affect the wall negatively. You're, the wall is it's made of plastic, right? And plastic is shiny, and so you will get hot spots. You'll lift the shadows up. You'll kill that contrast. And again, going back to dynamic range, that's information that's gone. You've lost that. Um, and it's also it can be very difficult to correct in post because you know if it's a slash of light from a leak or something across the wall. That's not just a, oh, you know, roto mask everything and lift everything up. That's specific to that section of the wall. It's very difficult to fix and pose. So you do need, you know, when, when we were building our studio, we put together a G&E package. And I think 50% of our cost went to things that were black cloth. <laughs> Flags and, you know, uh, duvetine and that sort of thing. Because spill control is such a big part of it. And when you're talking about a wraparound screen, the wall will self-illuminate. It'll cast light onto itself. And that's a whole other can of worms as well. So there's a lot, you know, spill control is really the, the main consideration with when you're talking about lighting control. You need to be very mindful and do everything you can to get light off of the screen. And a big part of that is being okay with walking the talent away from the screen. Everyone's talking about how close can I shoot, how close can I shoot. It doesn't matter how tight the pixel pitch is if you're blasting the screen with light. You need your talent to be far enough away that you can throw flags back there and actually give you some spill control. And, and that's an important part of this. But you look around and it's like, you know, I always laugh at it because, you know, it's like you brought back snoots, we brought back egg crates, we brought back, you know, all of the things that went away when soft boxes, because everybody got figured with a soft box and was okay. And then, oh, gee, you know, it's not just throwing up a 4 by 22K up and then putting a 4 by 4 in front of it and saying, okay, this is all the light you need for this. Now you have to mask all of that down. So we start getting back into the world of soft boxes and controlled soft contrast lighting and those kind of things. And it's an interesting rule for us because those give us the ability to shape light without spill in a way that we haven't had before. And it doesn't matter what kind of source it is. Using egg crates and shaping is, is all about this. And it's a throwback to, you know, a, an earlier time. So, Crispin, people are just now starting to find about Fresnels again. I, don't, I think that's kind of funny, too. Ah, so, oh, I missed you, Fresnels. I, I missed hard light, you know? It's like, <clears throat> people don't think about that. Um, and, and, and the lighting aspect is so hard and so difficult that, you know, that's one of the other crew positions. You have to have a virtual lighting designer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is one of the really cool things we can do is we can pixel map RGB lights with the Unreal Engine scene. Or, you know, you can use something like Disguise or like Pixera as well to do this. But that means that you can, as the camera's moving, you can actually have lights dynamically adjust themselves to act as like single pixel light sources on the fly, which is a really cool and powerful tool. And especially it's cool for like car process stuff where you can have overhead street lights and things like that. Um, so it's, it is another crew position. Or, you know, we can tie into the dimmer board as well to a certain extent. Um, but it, it just opens up this whole new level of possibility when it comes to dynamic lighting that you may not necessarily have had before. It, with a new level of interactivity as well that you, know, you, you don't normally get. Well, and, and that brings up all those, you know, again, we're having all of these positions come up. Let's talk about world operators and world, world builder versus world operator. Because that's another one of those crew positions like people don't understand. I, and I jokingly say that a lot of people who are world builders just aren't built for being in public. And, and I, that's not to be cruel or rude or anything, but it's like some people are just, they like being in quiet and enclosed spaces. And it's, it's, it's common, particularly in the gaming world. I found it more than any place other than code developers. They're the only place I've found people who just like to live in caves and, and don't come out in the daylight. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and you know, good on them, right? That's you, that's you sometimes, I know. Oh, absolutely, I, absolutely. I, I, you know, there's two positions, right? You have your two positions, I say. They're not official positions by any mean yet. It's just kind of the colloquial that we're using now. But you have someone who builds the Unreal 3D worlds, and then you have someone who operates them. And they could be the same person, but they typically aren't. Uh, it's kind of two different skill sets. Uh, the people who build the worlds, a lot of times they come from the gaming industry, because it's essentially the same thing as level design in any video game, just to a much higher level of fidelity. Um, the world operator is the, the person on set who you're saying, okay, let's move this light, let's move this prop over a little bit, let's make these tweaks, let's adjust the color in this section of the screen. And they need to be more attuned to film set work, and they need to be more attuned to, um, you know, like film terms, things like that. If they ideally they understand like what a tweeny is and what a C stand is and these sorts of things, so that you can tell them what you're trying to emulate. Um, and that's the you know the Venn diagram of people in the world that know Unreal Engine well enough to do that and who understand the film set well enough to do that is very small. Yeah, a couple and of hands worth. A couple <laughs> of hands worth, yeah. And so you know, I, I'm one of them. 
Um, and that's why a big part of studios and uh, you know people who are in this industry is training. We're trying to teach people these things. I always um, think about uh, Armageddon, right? Where, <laughs> where they, you know, they train uh, they train miners how to be astronauts. Well, wouldn't it have just been easier to train astronauts how to mine things, right? <laughs> That's kind of where we're at. Like, it's easier to, to teach someone who works in a film set on Real Engine than it is the other way around. Right. Um, and so that's just the approach that a lot of us are taking. Well, it, and it, it brings up an interesting point because people don't think about any of that. They don't think about those kind of positions and how you have to learn and work. And, and the difficulty it is working on set. I, I'm always stunned at people that, that don't realize how complicated it is in the political nature of working on a modern set. Yeah, you need to understand. I mean, you know, the political nature, obviously. There's, there's the po politics of film sets. You know, have existed since time immemorial. But, you know, understanding like what's an NDB, right? <laughs> Stuff like this is, it's not evident, and it's not easy to learn for people who, you know, are just Unreal Engine. And, and since you're talking about that, let me just harp about Unreal being X Y Z being incorrect and based on every other 3D application in the world. And, and it's like so. Just so everybody understands, um, Z space in 3D environments is distance. In Unreal, it's vertical height. They've since apologized, so you know if that means anything. Yeah, right. Still works the other way. They, they, it's not going to change in five either, as far as I understand. They've now thrown multiple industries into chaos with that decision. But if it, it's like so, Unreal works independent. Uh, it works differently than every 3D application in the world for where XYZ falls in space. And that's one of those things that's just as aptly mind-numbing to me. That's one of the big things that we spend a lot of time doing, because you have a camera tracking system that has its own coordinate system, and you need to map that to the one in Unreal. And, you know, positional axis, easy, fine, right? Oh, X is wrong, so change that to Y. Rotational axes become really tricky, because you start getting into, you know, a gimbal lock and things like that. It becomes kind of difficult. Um, it's. Uh, it's a weird problem. It's again, it's one of these things that all these different systems are speaking different languages. With time, it's going to get easier. But right now, it's just like, why? Why is this still a thing? Well, and and let's do. You know, we brought up cameras. People forget. Like we work in imperial camera systems in North America. Unreal is in metric. You better be doing the translation in real time because Unreal is in metric, and you have to do all of those, all your computations in metrics. So it's not the kind of thing that you think about when you go in and start working on a set. Now, the other interesting thing is that most lens encoders and lens information generate information in meters, not in not in imperial. Which as I it should be. As it should be. <laughs> so, but but all the lens information when you work at extended data or any of those, that the, the data that comes out is always in metric, not in imperial. It actually it actually have to, you have to force it to translate to imperial. But that's those are the kind of things that drive me crazy. If I were to buy a lens set and I was only buying it for virtual production, I probably would buy a metric lens set. It is just a lot easier because at the end of the day, you're in Unreal, everything needs to be centimeters. So if you buy a metric lens set, you move the decimal over and you're kind of done. Um, whereas with, you know, when we were doing imperial lens mappings um, the other day, it's, you're converting everything from imperial to centimeters ultimately, which is a pain in the butt. Yeah. Two and a half centimeters to the inch. It's kind of easy. 2.54. Yeah. See? <laughs> and, and, and he did that because accuracy is everything. And that, that, that point 0.4 is one of the things that he and I kind of joke about because that's kind of, you know, it's a 2 by 4. It's, it's, it's close enough. It's a 2 by 4. So, and, and, but it's not really 2 by 2 by or 4 by. I mean, on, you know, on cinema lenses, it, this is less of an issue with like still lenses or even rehouse still lenses. But on cinema lenses, the marks are so close together. You know, in some cases, uh, towards the close end of the range, they're just inches apart. And so that third decimal point actually does matter. Um, the accuracy is there there and it is available. So what are some of the things you run into? I mean, as far as? Eh, um, well, I mean, we know the crews are difficult. You know, training people to do all this stuff is, is, is a big deal. And, and the educational aspect of it is, is even harder sometimes. Um, what kind of crew do you, who do you look for? What do you look for in crew? How do you find it? You know, you're building a studio right now. You're trying to find, you know, station station managers and things like the station managers, floor manager, those kind of things for your sh show. What do you what are you looking for as crew? I mean, really, the, the big thing right now is they need to be flexible, right? They need to be um, patient and they need to be willing to learn new things. If they go in and they're like, I'm going to do this, and it's going to be this way, that can be a good thing in some circumstances. But they also they, they need to be willing to be told like that's not going to work. It's got to be done like this. 
you know, for now, for the next five years, until this piece of technology gets invented, this is how we have to do things. Um, the other thing about virtual production is that it adds steps to things, right? You're, we have to add a motion tracker onto your camera department. So if you're, you know, if you're a camera team, you need to be willing to let someone that you may have only met a few days ago futz with your camera. And that is a tricky thing sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, we talked about lighting. You need a gaffer who's really understanding of the screen and who is considering the screen and his lighting and things like that. Um, it, and it's just as far as working at a studio, it, you know, a lot of it is, is just are you willing to push the boundary and I come from special effects, like I come from practical effects. And in practical effects, that's where, that's where I really learned that, that standard, right? Does the audience think it's real? If you make a prop severed head and you give it to someone, you don't want the reaction to be, oh, that's a cool prop severed head. You want them to be like, oh my god, why are you handing me a severed head? <laughs> and that's the same thing. That's what you're looking for in people that you hire. They need to have that level of, of quality in them and that they're always constantly striving for. Because ultimately, that's what we're trying to deliver to the audience. And, and that's one of the power, power, most powerful things of virtual production, is the ability to, to, to put this up and make it believable. Whether it's The Mandalorian, Westworld premieres tonight, and Westworld does it on film, just so everybody understands. How Westworld actually shoots be? and does their virtual television production on film. <laughs> yeah, I know the guy that helped write the code, he's a friend of ours, and it's like, yeah, it's not, not I, I don't envy them that process, knowing what they've gone through on it. But it, it seems fun. I mean, I, I've actually not shot virtual production on film yet, but I would absolutely love to. I think it sounds like a blast. Just, you know, I mean, it's, it's another level of complexity. Oh, you know, <laughs> now we're shooting with celluloid. But I think that it could actually be, be really fun. And one of the interesting things about it that I'm curious to see in Westworld when it, when it uh, premieres, you know, a lot of times um, shows shooting on virtual production will use anamorphic lenses because they have this weird, you know, characteristic to them that can make it difficult to... Uh, for the audience to figure out, okay, where does the weirdness of the virtual world end and where does the weirdness of the um, real world begin? And so I'm curious as to if shooting on film lends to that even more, if it will just blend those worlds together by adding another layer of you know, weirdness, essentially. Sorry, the, 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 the tearing thing caught my eye for a second. I, I didn't know what that was. But, but, and that's an interesting thing because the lensing is a big part of it. And it was, that was actually one of the things with the Mandalorian. They used anamorphics because they could hide some of the things in the way the anamorphics are designed because they use Primos. Um, but that's, that's an interesting aspect of it, that you're actually using lensing to, to create some of the effect of the virtual world and minimize the reality of the production. I mean, that's, that's the state of the art in what it's doing because you're marrying both worlds together. Yeah, and that blend is is critical, right? It, really, so much of what my job as a supervisor is is helping the crew blend the virtual and the physical world together. Lenses are a big part of that. Camera choice can be a big part of that. Another thing is um, matching like your black points and your highlights, right? So a really common mistake that people will make is, oh, you're shooting um, uh, outside or some or you know maybe at night and you have like street lights in the scene. Well, if your key light is brighter on your histogram or your waveform then you know your street lights in your scene that's wrong right that's not how it would be in real life it would actually be the opposite and so exposure is really key um, and that's just one of the ways that you can blend the worlds together same thing with the black level uh, we were talking about lights washing out the screen that's another really kind of dead giveaway that the people shooting are maybe not that experienced with shooting on screens um, and you'll notice a mismatch right the shadows will be pitch black in the foreground but they may be lifted in the background or sometimes vice versa yeah, and 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 that's a that's a mismatch in the in the visual side, which instantly tells you you're in a in a, in a fake set. I mean, it's, it's there's nothing giveaway. that takes me out of a picture more than a flat wall. I mean, the lack of contrast on the wall is is one of the biggest issues that we all run into. Um, well, we got a couple minutes left because we you, you have another class to do later this afternoon. That's going to go upstairs. What's something you want people to know about virtual production? Oh man, I I mean, I would say just. So what really, I think, interests me the most about virtual production, you know, obviously we have shows like Mandalorian, we have shows like Westworld, these like big shows doing big scenes, and obviously that's super exciting. We're building a big studio, so if you have one, please come see me. But I am also really interested in how does this affect just the, the pedestrian everyday shooting, right? Two people talking in a room, maybe talking in a restaurant, something like that. It's, I, I'm curious to see if we can get to a point where shooting on an LED wall becomes economical and makes sense for those kinds of scenes as well. Um, 
And those are, in many ways, are the scenes that are more difficult to do because you know what that looks like. You know what it's like to be in a restaurant. And so if it looks wrong, you're instantly going to know. Whereas, you know, you're shooting on Tatooine. Well, I mean, I haven't been there yet, so I have no idea what it looks like. Well, it looks like Tunisia, so it's like... <laughs> looks been there either. <laughs> but, but, but that's the point is, is that, that, you know, we're here to try and evoke a new environment and build a new world from it. But it's also the aspect of, you know, we could get a whole day sunrise you know we don't have to worry about the golden hour anymore we can hold that forever we can work when we work with children we don't have to worry about location transfers and everything else we can get them on set you know day for night night for day is is we don't have to do those anymore because we can control everything you don't think about that aspect safety on set because of explosions and things that can be you know created and, and shielded from the actor so safety is a big issue but it's all of those things but it's but but people don't think about the cost savings in virtual production without without transpo. You know, you, when you reduce the amount of crew, when you reduce the number of extras because you can make them virtually, which is still a task. We're working on it. Yeah, we, and that's still a couple of years from real real perfection. Yeah. One thing I'll say is I've spoken with location managers, like on on the shows that are shooting here in Chicago, that are very against virtual production. Right? They're, they get very defensive about it. It's never going to replace locations. It's never going to go anywhere because they're worried about their jobs. And you know, I, it makes sense, rightly so. I think. However, it's not a replacement. It's never going to be a replacement for location work. It's never going to be a replacement for studio work. It's another option. It's a third option yeah. for certain scenes, right? You're never, you know, the, the biggest LED volumes in the world are still only like 75 feet in diameter, right? How are you going to shoot a James Bond foot chase across a city there? You're probably not. So there are always going to be scenes that you're going to need to go on location for. The department's not going away. Um, but at the same time, from a production standpoint, it adds that third option. It adds another tool in the box for them to make their project and deliver it on time and on budget. Yeah, I'm not seeing James Bond or, or Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible on doing doing any of that running or leaping across buildings on a virtual wall. It runs straight into the wall. <laughs> You're right, Tom. Well, he broke it that time, though. <laughs> but but that's the reality of it is that people don't think about that, and they're always worried about their jobs and not looking at the aspects. I see virtual production, particularly here in Chicago, as an outlet for more and more content here. I, I mean, it's it's we have such a vibrant film and television community here in Chicago, and to be able to have more of this means that we can work year round. You know, you know we don't get that three month lag in the winter when it's sub zero and you know nobody wants to go outside and work unless you're Chicago Fire and you're doing a you know a fire scene where there's something warm around you. We don't get to do that. And it's important for people to understand that, that virtual production is a way to bring more business and more work and more crews to Chicago to do more things. And it's going to be a bigger project for us. Yeah, I mean, that is one of the big disadvantages of Chicago is the fact that it becomes inhospitable for four or five months a year, right? So by having this technology, you can shoot beach scenes in the winter. You could shoot snow scenes in the summer. And you could shoot snow scenes in the summer now, obviously, but it's very difficult. This makes it a lot easier. So it, it does open up that possibility of shooting year-round. And that you know, just furthering the Chicago film industry reduces that, like, well, why wouldn't we shoot in Chicago? Would that come out with the tax credit? I mean, it's starting to make the city a very appealing place to shoot. Well, and the tax credit makes a big deal in here. And, and because the growing film community here, having virtual production, is going to lead this economy. And I mean, we're not taking so. any jobs away. We're, we, we want more people to come. We want more work here. We want this to be a center for virtual production because we, I mean, we have access, you know, we're close to Toronto. We're in between New York and LA. It makes it easier. And I we see- We have good pizza. Uh, 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 we have good food all around, not just pizza. Pizza sucks, actually. And like, find, 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 find a good Detroit tavern style, not this thick crust. <laughs> But, but I mean, I think about it, and, and, and I look at the aspects of things like doing pickups and doing other things. Now that we're going to do these and be able to do stuff with virtual production where we're literally doing, um, you know, picking up stuff and saying, hey, wait, let's do photogametry of our sets. Let's do this. So if we need to do pickups later on, pickups can be done anywhere. And I think that aspect of virtual production is a big deal because doing inserts, doing go back and doing pickups, doing those kind of things is often quite costly for a lot of productions, particularly episodic production, where having that content virtually and being able to do a, a little bit, you know, 30 or 40 seconds or a minute or two to fill a shot makes a big deal in most environments. Yeah, and you know, speaking of photogrammetry, photogrammetry, for those who don't know, is the process of taking many photos of all angles of an object or of an environment and using a piece of software to triangulate all those angles and reconstruct a 3D model from them. The software for that, thanks, you know, Epic Games just bought Reality Capture, which is a very, very good piece of software for that, and you can now use it for free. So you can use your phone, take 360 photos of an object, and then bring that into Unreal Engine, all for free at this point. And so the barrier to entry and the complexity of that has 
come down so low that there's kind of no reason not to do it, right? If you have a set built on a show, there's no reason not to just use a DSLR, shoot, you know, 800 photos of it, and then you have a 3D model of it that you can load up in Unreal at any point and shoot pickups from, from any angle. Well, and, and that brings up an interesting point, is I reached for my phone in my pocket because it was going off, but, but the reality of it is, is until we start getting as much data on set as we can do on our phones, it'll never ever, we, this, this is the holy grail right now. This has got LiDAR in it, this has got 3D in it, it's got interconnectivity. Um, it's kind of amazing that, that you know, we're doing this and, and the phone is still the standard for which we're trying to reach things. And like, oh wow. Um, it's got GPS tracking, it's got positional data, it's got metadata, it's got LiDAR, wow. It's got kind of everything I need, so. It's, I mean, it is definitely like, it's got the kitchen sink, but it's not particularly good at any one of them, right? Well, I mean, that's exactly right. <laughs> we were talking about CamTrack AR um, with someone earlier, and it, you know, it's, the, what you can do with CamTrack AR, which is a piece of software for your phone, I guess you, you would call it an app then, um, that uses like the LiDAR sensors in your phone to generate AR content, and you can do like live keying, and you can add on 3D environments behind people and things like that. It's incredible what you can do. I mean, it, you know, if that tool was available when I was 12, years old making movies, I mean, it would have just changed everything. Um, but, you know, the reasons that there are limitations to it and there's reasons that, you know, it's not yet ready for the high end. Now, I'm very curious to see where we're going to be in 20 years if those tools come to, to film and come to cinema. And there's an infinite amount of possibilities, you know, when you start breaking things down to that level of granularity, when you start being able to do live comping, not just with an LED wall or with a green screen, but just because of machine learning, right? Or if you can train an AI on what a lens looks like and then nullify that out and then add on the characteristics of another lens. So there's a lot of really interesting possibilities in the future um, that uh, I think are really going to change the way that creatives think about the process. Andy, with that, I'm going to let you go because I know you've got to go upstairs and get set up for your 1.30 class. We thank everybody for showing up. Um, and we thank you for being here on the live stream for Filmscape 2020. Um, Andy Jarish, Smash Studios here in Chicago. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, no worries. Thank you for having me again. And yeah, um, we are, we'll be opening our studio and it's in the South Loop in about three weeks. So if you've got a project, hit me up. Love to talk with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.